This is Phil Koopman with a tutorial on safety requirements. Safety requirements specify what it means for your system to actually be safe. The following are signs that you have problems with your safety requirements. First, if you do not have distinctly defined safety requirements, then you have not defined what safe actually means for your system. Next, if you have a set of system requirements and all of them are safety critical, then it is going to be difficult and expensive to build your system. Finally, if you have safety requirements that cannot really be validated, then you'll never be able to prove that you actually did build a safe system. Well, I'm going to use the term safety. In fact, the concepts for safety requirements apply to any mission critical functionality whether that functionality prevents death or injury to people, or instead is intended to prevent expensive system outage or other similar critical failures. When specifying safety, it is important to realize that having a system working, meaning performing its normal functionality, is not the same as that system being safe. Safety goals are the highest level of system requirements that are designed to ensure that mishaps or other loss events cannot happen. In general, each identified critical system mishap traces to a hazard, and that hazard is mitigated by a safety goal. Safety goals can be achieved by some combination of ensuring software correctness, having backup systems, creating fail-safes, creating safety net architectures, and so on. Thus, picking a safety goal tends to influence the architectural approach taken to achieve safety. It is important to realize that safety is often much more about what the system does not do than what it actually does in normal functionality. For example, consider a system that is safe when its power is turned off. Normal functionality might involve when you press the on button, the system turns on. But safety is more likely a combination of two things. First, it turns off when you press the off button. And second, a bit more subtly, it does not turn on all by itself, even though nobody pressed the on switch. Safety requirements are more detailed system requirements that support the safety goals. Typically, the big distinction between safety goals and safety requirements is that the safety requirements have been broken down so that each safety requirement can be allocated to an individual subsystem or component, where safety goals apply at the whole system level. To build your system, you therefore need safety goals at the top at the system level and safety requirements that make sure the safety goals are achieved by each of the components working together within the system. The most important thing about safety requirements is realizing that they must be treated specially. You must identify all the requirements that apply to a system that are safety related. Then you must apply an increased level of engineering rigor according to the safety integrity level or SIL for those requirements. It is common to see an overly simplistic approach that makes systems unnecessarily expensive and difficult to implement. That approach starts with a set of all the system requirements. Then the requirements that are clearly supporting the safety goals are highlighted in this example in red. The problem is once you do that, another analysis reveals that other requirements support the highlighted requirements. So the supporting requirements are also safety related. So they have to be in red. As a simple example, in a car, you'd expect that applying the main service brakes to stop the vehicle is safety critical. But after the requirements for the main service brakes have been highlighted in red, you'll soon discover that other parts of the system can compromise the operation of the brakes. That means that things like anti-lock braking and vehicle stability control will also have safety critical requirements because they both can interfere with the operation of the braking system. Once you've highlighted those in red, you'll find out that the wheel speed sensors are also safety critical because those are inputs fed in to the anti-lock braking system and so on. The problem is that by the time you've peeled back all the layers of supporting requirements, 
it is common to find out that most, or perhaps even all, of the requirements in your system have been tagged as red, and they're all safety critical. Even worse, if you have, say, 20 normal requirements and one safety requirement allocated to a module, that whole module has to be safety critical, including all the software to implement the non-safety requirements. That's because once you're inside a module, you cannot guarantee that the normal software will not interfere with a safety function. Thus, even if a modest fraction of the requirements have been annotated as safety critical, if they're spread around the system, you're back to finding out that your entire system ends up being safety critical. Safety critical software is typically difficult and expensive to implement compared to normal software. So if your approach to safety identifies requirements that are smeared throughout your system, what you'll find is the whole thing becomes very difficult, time-consuming, and expensive to build because everything ends up being safety critical. There has to be a better way, and fortunately, there is one. The better way involves using the concept of a safety envelope. A safety envelope can be explained using the following sequence of ideas. First, sketch a picture of the operational state space of your system in terms of where it is safe and where it is unsafe. As a two-dimensional example, consider one state as vehicle speed and the other state as turning radius. Safe for this situation means that there is no chance of a vehicle rollover, and unsafe means the vehicle is likely to roll over at a particular combination of speed and turning radius. In general, real systems have a great many number of states, but it is common for each hazard to involve just one or two or a few of those states rather than all of them. So you end up drawing a separate safety envelope for each hazard that's relevant to your system. This picture is a concrete representation of what safe means for your system. If you're in the green, you're safe, and if you're in the red, you're unsafe. However, as you can see from this example, the boundary between safe and unsafe might be irregular and, in fact, might not be clearly known at any particular point. In other words, the boundary can be complicated and sometimes a bit fuzzy. The next step is to under-approximate the safe region. By this, what I mean is, pick a subset of the state space to declare as safe and draw as simple a bounding box around it as you can. Keep in mind when you're drawing this, what you're really doing is creating a rule set for deciding what's safe and what's unsafe. So simple isn't necessarily the picture, but rather simple rules that allow you to draw a shape around the safe space that is easy to understand and monitor. Then you declare that anything outside the bounding box is presumed to be unsafe, even if in some cases that might be pessimistic. This results in an over-approximation of the unsafe region as shown. In other words, we've drawn a simplified version of the diagram that still makes sure that when you think it's safe, it's really safe, but it makes it easy to understand the boundary between safe and presumed unsafe. Then, you can design your system so that it triggers a system safety, shutdown, fail-safe, or other safing response whenever you see a transition into the unsafe region. There are assumptions, such as that the fail-safe can respond in time to prevent significant harm, even though you've momentarily entered the unsafe region. But in real systems, generally this works out due to natural time constants of the system, or by adding a little extra margin to trip just before you enter the unsafe state space region. Once you take this view of the system, you can then partition the requirements. The operational requirements talk about what happens in the safe portion of the region, the green region. In general, optimization of behavior is all about what happens in the green region, and those requirements tend to be more complex. Safety usually doesn't have much to do with what happens in the green region. Rather, 
Safety cares about not doing something unsafe, in other words, keeping out of the red region. That means you can have a completely separate set of requirements that are all about detecting being in the red region and doing some safing action to your system to keep it safe if that should happen. Those requirements generally correspond to the notion of a safety function as defined by functional safety standards. Now let's park this idea on the side for a moment and take a look at the architecture that is well suited to this sort of approach. And then in the following slide, we'll combine the two ideas. A good architecture for implementing a safety envelope is the doer checker pair. The doer subsystem implements normal functionality. So all the requirements aimed at optimizing normal operational behavior can be allocated to the doer. The checker subsystem exists to implement the fail safes or other safety function. That means that all the requirements aimed at detecting unsafe situations and shutting the system down can be allocated to the checker subsystem. Taking this approach, the checker is entirely responsible for safety. This is true by definition because the safety functions have all been allocated to the checker. This in turn means that the doer can be designed to a low safety integrity level because any failure by definition cannot make the system unsafe because the checker is preventing that from happening. The doer can still have an incorrect implementation and that might attempt to drive the system into an unsafe state. But such incorrect behavior is just an availability problem. In other words, the doer can make the system fail, but it cannot make it fail in a way that is unsafe. On the other hand, the checker must have a high safety integrity level because it has the responsibility for system safety. While this might sound like a superficial exercise in just shuffling things around, it brings with it three really compelling benefits. The first benefit is that by aggregating all the safety requirements to a single module, that means the other modules are not safety critical and therefore can be developed using less rigorous and less expensive engineering approaches if desired. Second, because the doer is not safety critical, you can change it as often as you need to without having to recertify system safety. The third benefit is that the checker is often much simpler than the doer because it does not have to perform optimization, but rather just check a boundary to make sure that boundary is not crossed. Of course, all this comes at the cost that the checker must be high sill but in a safety critical system, something has to be in charge of safety, so you might as well make it the smallest, simplest piece you can. A best practice for building safety critical systems is to use the doer checker architectural pattern. Allocate the main functional requirements to a low sill doer and allocate safety requirements to a high sill checker. An example of this might be a speed limit for a vehicle. The doer can deal with providing smooth acceleration, optimizing fuel consumption, and so on. And the checker can simply be watching to make sure that the maximum safe speed for the vehicle is not exceeded. The doer can do whatever it wants as long as it does not violate the speed limit, and the checker is there to keep things safe. Using this pattern often requires rethinking the notion of safety to create a safety envelope approach. However, this rethinking pays off by reducing the scope of how much of the system must be developed to high sill levels of engineering rigor. Next, make sure you have good safety requirements. They should trace to system level safety goals and be orthogonal to normal functionality so that you can get a clean separation between the doer and the checker. This separation approach can make safety simpler to validate than an integrated system approach because safety can be determined by validating just the checker, including testing, peer reviews, and other software quality techniques. Because the safety functions have been allocated to the checker, 
testing for safety largely involves exercising the checker box and making sure that you didn't miss anything using your engineering process. Some system testing is also appropriate to find missed nuances and requirements and so on, but in general, the checker itself must be the thing that maintains system safety. As with any approach, there are some pitfalls and trade-offs. The first pitfall is that making the safety envelope simpler to check can cost ability to optimize. This is an intentional trade-off that sacrifices the permissiveness of the safety checker to keep things simple. Put another way, using this architectural pattern gives up your ability to operate in the irregular regions near the safety boundary. But in return, what you get is a system that is much easier to build and demonstrate safe. A consequence of this trade-off is that if you want to make the doer more complex and more aggressive at the boundary of safety, that's going to increase the complexity of the checker to increase permissiveness. The other big pitfall is that a doer checker pair is a fail silent architectural pattern. If your system requires fail operational functions, you're going to have to use either multiple doer checker pairs or more sophisticated safety architectural patterns.